Well, I am so humbled to be asked to do a, a documentary on my life story. And um, I'm, I, it's, it's an honor to do this. My name is uh, Todd Riggs, and I am both a pastor and a licensed independent clinical social worker, where I serve and I'm the founder of Affinity Ministries, Inc., and I do and provide therapy and counseling along with uh, business coaching and personal coaching and uh, individual um, spiritual direction um, here in my office. The other thing that Affinity does is do we do uh, short-term medical missions and I, I try to get out about every two years to do that. About four or five years ago uh, I, I um, published a memoir, my memoir, of, of my life story. It's called A Boy from Malachit. It describes my my early upbringing regarding um, live you know living in in the Pacific Northwest and growing up on Puget Sound on Wallachia Bay. But I will I will try to unpack some of the things uh, that that occurred to me and what happened to me as a boy, and um, I'm just glad that I get to tell my story. How do you talk about something that has gone on for the for the last almost six de decades? Um, because that's where my journey began. I was born and raised in Tacoma, Washington, in the late '50s, and uh, my both my parents met while they were they were professional ice skaters for Holiday on Ice. Uh, my dad was a clown, and my mom was a figure skater, and they traveled the world in their early 20s. And I still remember in our house in Tacoma, the, all, the, all the things that they accumulated from their travels and the things that were in the downstairs basement and the things that were in the living room of, of just everywhere they went, they traveled the world. My, my dad would say that uh, the, one of his honors was that he was able to skate before the Queen of England. One of the things that happened, um, and when I remember as a, in a memory, is my dad and the ice show came to the Seattle Coliseum, and I remember being up in the uh, the stadium watching, watching the ice show start and skate, and everybody was skating. But before the ice show started, there that my dad was down in the dressing room getting ready, and a very very famous clown. Uh, that was all the kids in the Pacific Northwest knew about. His name was J.P. Patches. And my dad had a surprise, and, and that was like when I went into the, the, the dressing room where he was getting ready to skate, uh, J.P. Patches was there all made up. And it was, it was like a boy's dream come true. And then when the show started and I was in the bleachers with my mom, uh, the Coliseum, I, I still remember to this day that my dad is down there skating, and there's, there was probably close to three to 5,000 people in this mini Coliseum. It was, it's still there, the Seattle Coliseum. And he was skating, and, and, and it's a clown, and people were laughing, and, and um, I mean, pies were being flown and, uh, thrown, and uh, they would go up into the audience. They, they were actually plants, you know, so they knew these people, but they would harass different people in the, in the, uh, in the bleachers. And I kept saying, that's my dad. And he, 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 he look at him skate. And, and I was, it was for a, for a seven-year-old boy, actually it was probably a five-year-old boy, um, I, was, I was at that point, I realized how proud I was for my parents who skated uh, all over the world. Well, when they settled down, we ended up in Tacoma and I, had the, I was very fortunate to spend a lot of time on Gravelly Lake where I learned to ski, uh, water ski. And I think I, I think I got up on the two boards some, sometime in between the ages of five and six. And I've uh, been skiing ever since. And shortly after that, uh, when I was 11, my parents um, bought a home in, in, in Gig Harbor uh, at, on, on uh, Wallachia Bay. 
It was a small cottage with a, a, an addition of about three bedrooms, and it was on 120 feet of waterfront. And for an 11-year-old boy to, to be on the beach and be raised on the water, little did I know that there was a tremendous, tremendous upbringing. I am so thankful that to this day, all the kids that were raised on the bay, we are still friends. And uh, we're in their, our 50s and 60s, and we, so we talk we, we talk a lot to each other uh, and, and about those memories. A couple things happened to me when I was a boy, and um, that also was part of my upbringing that was involved, what actually, how, how can I say this, really was the trajectory that got me into mental health. The first thing that happened was um, at age five, I was attacked by a hive of yellow jackets. Bees were all around me. They were all on me. I was getting stung. And I just booked it for, for home. And uh, what I was told is that they lost count of the bee stings. And uh, I almost died that day um, because my mom grabbed me. Uh, the bees, some of the bees were still following me home and threw me into a big bucket of uh, calamine lotion to help with the, help with the stings and the, and, and the swelling. What also happened uh, during that time is when we, when we, right before we moved to uh, Wallachet, my dad uh, uh, started the ski patrol at Crystal Mountain Ski Resort. And I still remember to this day, we were testing out the walkie-talkies in the summertime and we were walking all over the mountain. And um, the, the pictures are it's just hilarious. I mean, just this boy walking around with his dad and the others, making sure the walkie-talkies were being tested. But again, it was is what my dad did. Um, he at that point got a job with working with IBM, and uh, and he was in com computer programming all the, all the way through his, the course of his life. When we moved to the harbor, uh, at that same time, my my father was asked to. Um, become general manager at that time of a brand new ski resort called Alpental. And it was in 1968, or 67, 68. And so uh, we, he, took up, he took a leave of absence from IBM and he, uh, for two years, ran the, ran the ski resort. During the weekends, we, we skied and we lived in the, in the giant lodge uh, on the second floor. There was, there was a small apartment there and on the weekends we, we, we lived there and then during the, during the week uh, we were living in, in Gig Harbor and where we, my, my sister and I went to school. Um, on, one of those, on one of those weekends when we were skiing, it was, it was again, I, I look back and we'd get up to the area, to the ski area sometime around five o'clock on a Friday and, and I'd night ski until 10 o'clock. So five hours of skiing at night and then the next morning getting up with the avalanche crew who were blowing up the hills for the avalanches, getting all the avalanches all taken care of. And I, my dad and I, he said, Todd, come along. And so I was, I think I was 11, 10, I was 10. Um, and we'd go up with the avalanche crew and ski untouched powder and, and for two or three hours. And the, the area actually uh, would open up around 8.30 and we'd, we'd be on top of the hill at five, quarter to five. So we had like almost three hours of skiing these, these incredible runs, untouched powder. And I'll never forget those, those memories. I also don't, I also need to tell you that, um, which is a joke in my family, that at the age of 10 and 11, the, the avalanche crew uh, really wanted me to carry the dynamite up on the chairlift. And so here I am, probably 80 pounds, picking up this you know, 10, 15 pound lug of dynamite and, and putting it on the chair with me. And they would take it to the top of the mountain. One of those times, uh, my dad and I slipped off uh, and, and went down uh, an, a, a run called International um, at Alpental, and we were looking for the back bowls so we could do some deep, deep powder skiing before the, before the public had access to them, uh, to the runs. And so we, we cut across this, this large bowl way up high, and we came up to a ridge, and my dad was, was cutting, the, cutting the trail. And I was behind him, probably 15, 20 feet behind. And then on this ridge, and my dad looked, turned around, looked at me, and he said, "Okay, Todd, but stay in my tracks and just don't fall, don't cut an edge, um, because there's there's a sheet of ice underneath the new fallen uh, eight inches of snow." And I said, "Okay." Uh, and I have rehearsed, I have rehearsed that memory 
many, 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 many times, gone over it in my head. Because what happened next is I started traversing across the trail. My dad was watching from about 30 feet away and I cut an edge and I started the slide and I couldn't stop the slide. And I slipped off the ledge of this cliff. Well, my dad, as my dad watched, um, I slipped off the, the ledge of a 10 story cliff. It, I hit ledges, uh, I hit a, two or three ledges on the way down. And it's true, when you are free falling, for me it was, as a boy, age 10, it was, it was like everything went into slow motion. And uh, I, all I remember is seeing all the rock go by and everything slowed down. And, it, and then I, then I re realized and, and just, I just sensed that this, there was this presence that just circled me. It was like, it was like I, was in a, I was in a bubble. And it was loving and it was caring, empathy and compassionate. And I was not scared of it. I was not scared of, I was not even scared of the, of the falling. But I knew that there was something that was around me that was protecting me. And so when I hit the, the bottom of the, of the, of the snow, um, it took my dad four or five minutes to come off the cliff and, and, and ski around. And I, all I remember is I was holding my head and holding my, my ribs. Um, I had a huge headache and I had no broken bones. But my dad threw off his skis. Um, and again, he's the general manager. He's the boss. He's the boss man. And, and he, he just came up and hugged me. And he cried. He just cried. He just, and he said, I'm so glad you're okay. And I said, my head hurts. And my, my chest hurts. And so because he had the walkie-talkie, he called in the, ski, the other members of the ski patrol to come down. And, and I was carried off the mountain that day. That whole experience, uh, I will never, ever, ever forget. Um, and I, I found out, I found out like 30, 30, 40 years later that I didn't realize my mom was angry at my dad for just, for just allowing that to happen. Um, but it happened and that was part of the spiritual grounding that's, that God started to do with me. And so that was age 10. Um, and at the age of 14, again, we're living on Wallachia Bay. Um, at the age of 14, I was uh, just out of eighth grade, going into ninth grade. And we were on a public three-week tour. It was a class that was in the summertime of touring all the entire state of, um, of Washington. And uh, we were, there was, I think, 15 of us. And it was fun because we slept in the gym gymnasiums. We saw all the really cool parts of the state. And uh, I, we were at the, we were at this uh, grain grain place, this farming uh, company, and I was not looking. And little did I know that this red truck was barreling around the, the corner. He didn't see me. I didn't see him. And he hit me. And then proceeded the truck uh, actually rolled over me. And I'm so glad that that my students, the, my fellow students, were around me. Uh, and um, uh, when, I, when I found out later from the hospital that everything was crushed in my legs except the bones. So the, it was a compression, all the muscles, all the blood vessels squished and then went back up. And, um, uh, but the bones were, were not broken again. No broken bones with, this, with the cliff fall and no broken bones with this. I tried to stay, we, there was a lot of walking during that tour. And so I tried to stay, stay with the tour, but after about four or five days, I said, I think I need to go home. So I went home and, uh, when, and went home early. And the thing that, that was really puzzling is that both with the cliff incident and with the truck incident, my parents, once they realized I was okay, it should, life just went on. And uh, in my childhood, there, there were at least five significant traumas. I don't have the time to get into them today. Um, and the book, the book, I go into good detail with them. And I, and I look back on those times and I wish, I wish I would have had some kind of a therapist to work with because I had all this, all this, these questions about the cliff, all these questions about why, you know, why wasn't I injured more? The other thing about the cliff that I want to add is that a month after uh, I, I went off the cliff, uh, slid off the cliff. 
uh, my family was notified that a ski instructor um, went off the same cliff I did a month later and he was killed. And so at age 10, I had this haunting question. Why did he die? And why did I live? For a 10 year old, uh, and I'm an adolescent and child therapist, you can't get your head around that. Um, and, I, and to this day, I often wonder. And, but the survivor's guilt stayed with me through the course of my childhood and my adolescence and early adulthood. Because it, it kind of, it, I, the, th the question was, is, am I supposed to do something? And why, did, why did I stick around and, and why did this guy die? And when I was in ninth grade, um, uh, shortly after the, the red truck rollover, um, I got back to the house and, and I had a full exam and the doctor said, okay, Todd, from here on out, you need to know something. Everything you do is going to be moderate. I want you to go home, look up the dictionary word moderate. And I, and I kind of got all cocky with it. I said, no, I, 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 I listen, I, I'm in Boy Scouts and I'm scheduled to go on a 50 mile hike around the Wonderland Trail in Mount, in Mount Rainier in 30 days and I'm going. And the doctor said, you're not going. You, there's no way, your legs won't, won't take it. And my mom looked at me and she goes, you, Todd. I said, I'm going. We're gonna be out on glaciers for a whole week, hiking and bears and being with my buddies. I'm going. Well, chalk it up to stubbornness or whatever. I went. 30 days later after the, after the rollover, um, I went on the, the, the seven day hike and we hiked 50 miles around half of the Wonderland Trail that summer. Um, and I'm really glad I went. So, so ninth grade, um, it's, in the, it's in the fall of 1972. Uh, I, I am with my friends at the state fair. I come home, to, well, I'm just really enthusiastic to tell my dad um, all the stuff that we did that day. And my dad was out, he, he walked up, it's like as I was dropped off, he was walking up the, the the walkway and he looked at me and he said, I gotta talk to you. And I said, okay, what's going on? And he said, well, your mother went to the doctor today and she's been diagnosed with cancer. I said, what? And uh, it's in her lungs and there is a high probability that they're gonna take out one of her lungs because that's where, that's where the majority of the cancer is. Starting high school, excited to, to do the high school experience, and then told that your mom has cancer, and all the questions, all the questions, is she gonna die? How sick is she? So weeks ahead, um, I remember, I still remember this day, being, um, being at Alan Moore Hospital, Alan Moore is in Tacoma, and uh, we said goodbye to mom, uh, you know, in the hospital room. It was the night before the surgery. They were going to take out her lung the night, the, the next morning. And I remember, I, I turned I, before I got in the elevator. I just looked to the right and looked down to the to her room, and she had her her, her she stuck her head out, and she was crying. And um, she, I think, she was weeping for us. I I was incredibly sad as well. So for the next four years. Uh, ninth grade all the way through 12th. Um, mom went into remission uh, with her cancer. The lung was taken out, but there was always this, this cloud of, will the, will the future really come to pass? Um, is my mom gonna survive? Uh, because we had to adjust our whole schedules. And, and I think that's kind of where I learned how to take care of people. Uh, because my mom was not always able to go up, the, up and down the stairs to do laundry. and. Sometimes we had, we had to do, you know, the dishes and, and sometimes even help cook because my dad was working. And, uh, and so I, I had a wonderful high school um, experience, but I didn't, not, not very many people knew that my mom was sick and, um, um, and, I, carried, and I carried it very well. During that time, um, also my parents, uh, being in the community of Olachet Bay, there was a lot of partying, and uh, there were, especially in the, in the, uh, in the summertime. And in the summertime, the whole culture, all of our friends from the mountain, these early 20-year-old 
hippies and these guys who are just living life large uh, would come down and hang with us for three days. And my dad would literally have three day parties on the beach and the, the ski boats would be going, the beer and the, and the liquor would be flowing and uh, it was quite a time. And so I, to this day, I still remember stumbling over, you know, getting up in the morning and there, there would be 30 or 40 people in our living room sleeping in sleeping bags and, and still hung over from the, from the day before. And my dad asked me, can you, uh, he taught me how to make egg souffle. And so I was in charge of, make, of doing breakfast. And I was 14, 15, 16 during, those, the, during that time. But the other thing that, that um, I, I was not aware of at the time, because I thought that was normal, was there was a large amount of alcohol in our house. Um, and it was part of the age. My parents were in their early, early 30s, mid 30s. Everybody around the bay was around the same age. And people just drank and had a lot of fun. I have so many, many positive memories during that time with also the, the, the double-edged sword of mom is still sick and mom was drinking, dad was drinking. And at the age of 14, um, I, I was drinking quite heavily. And uh, my, at my, on my 14th birthday, my parents bought me a, a beer mug. And um, let's just say my, my parents to this day, I remember my parents would buy 25 to 30 cases of beer at a time. And it was part of the culture, but I didn't realize that I was, I was uh, a young adult child of an alcoholic. And being raised in an alcoholic home and what that does to a boy. And um, it, uh, it was part of my formation. And so uh, speed up to you know, I graduated in high school um, and uh, took a year off before going to college and um, worked because I wanted to save some money. And it was that December, it was December of 1977 where um, my, my mom was in the hospital um, and I was asked, I was called by by her two best friends to come to the hospital and meet with my mom. And uh, so I, I went um, and got there and both Audrey and Barb, uh, my, my mom's good friends from the harbor, stepped out and my mom looked at me from her bed and said, the doc, the doc, she said to me, uh, the doctors have told me that I have six months to live. And she started to cry. And then I looked at her being kind of humorous. I said, no, whoa, whoa, wait, whoa. If you start crying, I'm gonna start crying what? And um, so uh, we, we talked. Uh, we, I, I consoled her. I said, we're going to get through this. And so um, uh, six months later, she passed. And again, part of the trajectory of, of, of uh, an early parental death as, as a late teen, trying to leave the nest, trying to emancipate from the home and go into college, um, and that, that was very, very, very difficult. In college, and I was, went to Peninsula College up in Port Angeles, Washington, had a wonderful time there. And I'm really glad that I got out of the house because after my mom died, our family really, truly fell apart. Uh, my dad worked, worked really hard and he poured himself into work. I don't remember a lot of my younger sister, Chris, who was uh, four or five years younger than me. She really was like the f uh, disappeared. I, I don't really remember, I have, have a whole lot of memory. But I do know that it got really turbulent between the two of them. And uh, uh, to the point where I think my dad uh, asked my sister to leave the house. And so a lot of heartache. Um, the family was really split. And in the middle of all this, um, I was a Christian. Uh, one thing I forgot to add was in the spring of 1974, I was a sophomore, and I um, was invited to go to a Young Life meeting, uh, which is a parachurch ministry working with uh, high school kids. Um, and my friend said, come on, come on, Todd. It's, it's about 100 kids there. We, you know everybody. It's a lot of fun. So I went, 
And that night, even though I was raised and confirmed in church, that night um, the, the Young Life leader, Larry Wright, basically shared the gospel with me. Very elementary, very basic. And I remember Larry looked at me because I was one of the new newbies who came. There was like four or five of us who were new. And he just said, God wants a relationship with you. Jesus wants a relationship with you. And that night I gave my heart to, I gave my heart to Jesus. Um, and I was broken. Um, I was de depressed. I was anxious. I was a kid who had all this undealt with trauma uh, going on in his life. My parents were, were professional, you know, they, they, were, they were very extrovert and uh, loved to be around people. I was an introvert and I was an internal processor and I did not know how to deal with all the things that were going on. Uh, the death of a parent, uh, the, the sickness of a parent had some really traumatic experiences both at Alpental and and were being hit by hit by uh, a truck and the bee, the bee attack and and uh, did not know what to do with that so went to college uh, and received a, a bachelor of a, a bachelor of science in youth ministry youth counseling I went on to seminary and uh, then went on to graduate school seminary became a pastor pastored uh, a, in, in, uh, in the Midwest for a brief time because uh, I wanted to do mental health. And then uh, in the late 80s, was offered a job at Golden Valley Health Center, um, at, at which is an in, inpatient um, psych hospital in Golden Valley. And I was, became on staff there um, because they, they saw my, my youth ministry, my youth counseling degree, and my master's degree. And, uh, and that started my mental health. The journey. All this to say that I have a lot of bullet points in my life, things that I park on when I get asked to speak. Um, but the, the one that I wanted to share with you this, uh, today is that it, it, my, my life story can be summed up in, a, in, in one statement, that God took the pallet, a pallet of pain from, from a boy, that would be me, and he transformed it into a pulpit of purpose. God took really what was meant for evil and for tragedy and he transformed it so that it created purpose in me because like I said earlier, my heart is now, my congregation are my patients, my clients, um, and I'm very, very committed to that. And if he can do that with me, as broken and depressed and addicted as I was, he can do it with you.